chapter 22, cultural conflict, bubble, and bust. So again, the title's telling us a lot, right? Conflict, bubble, in the bubble bursts. 1919, 1932. So we're post-World War I, and we're heading towards the Great Depression. We're going to go through the roaring 20s here also and talk about the decade of the 1920s. So I'm going to start today with a, with a film, okay? Uh, the film, to kind of set the stage here, uh, regarding the racial strife that continued after World War I. So these African-American men go and fight in the war. Many lost their lives, but they, you know, they, they sacrificed and, and went to fight. They come back expecting better treatment. We, we've proven ourselves. You know, we, we are, um, you know, soldiers also. But they come back to still racism and hate and, and subjugation and oppression. Uh, so the end of the war for, for the African-American soldier meant a return to the racial divisions that had defined the country since its inception. Uh, so 350,000 African-American men served in the war, and they felt they deserved access to full citizenship. Of course, the Constitution already provided them with that, but they weren't getting it. Jim Crow, you know, laws that, that uh, continued to allow... Uh, the especially the white supremacists in the South, but but nationwide also to further oppress African American people. Uh, you know, people continue to circumvent the law and discriminate, and continue to treat them with cruelty and disdain. Uh, so the soldiers felt their comp their contribution and sacrifice earned them the right to gain access to their already, uh, you know. Uh, deserved uh, rights, but they weren't getting it. So whites respond with violence, and you have an increase post-war, increase in lynching, increase in race riots, murdered returning servicemen in, in their uniforms, okay? Just an absolute hate, absolute hatred and bitterness about the color of somebody's skin. It's, 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 it's remarkable. Uh, what, what, what causes the, the conflict? What, why so much, uh, you know, uh, uh, hate and Gain. Well, I mean, it's about jobs, it's about housing. Now, now that the white men come back from the war, they want their factory jobs back. That many African Americans have have the opportunity to, to work and get a job and get ahead. Now they want that. They they want their jobs back. The war is over. We want we, we're coming back to the factory. They have race riots. 1917 East St. Louis. Nine whites, 40 blacks killed in a riot. By September of 2019, 120 people have been killed due to racial violence in just that year. Okay, so let's start with a film entitled Race Riot of 1919 in Omaha, the lynching of Will Brown. So understand that lynching is not always, you know, hanging somebody. It's when a group of people deliver what vigilante justice, at, at least what they think so, on a person, grab a person, and and kill him in some in some you know uh, in some way. So in this case, you'll see that it wasn't wasn't exactly a hanging, but still a a mob of people that that killed this this man. Go ahead and watch that film. Okay, so the hopeless conditions continued after the war for people of color. Uh, there was no unity of purpose gained from the war between the races that you'd think would have happened. They fought together in this horrific war side by side, not always side by side, usually segregated, but in some cases. But you would have thought that that would bring you closer together, but but now the violence is, is back and it, it spreads into the north. So it's not just in the south anymore. So so previous gains pre-war, we remember the progressive era. They all the all the all the reforms, the progressive era were diminished after this war. So I mentioned before how World War One put a quick end to the progressive era of reform, it doesn't just come right back. So labor would scale back to pre-war levels. Labor movement lost some of its momentum. Another issue or, or idea that came out of World War I is fear of communism, the Red Scare. So, you know, things, anything with the red, red in its title, I married a communist, Bolshevism. We talked about the Bolshevik Revolution and how the people of Russia rose and, and had a coup d'etat and overtook the government and made it a communist country. 
this is the the opposite of America's ideology. So America was taught to you know to be against this in the very beginning. Uh, Red Menace, Red China, the movie Red. It's anti-communist hysteria. Uh, this is actually the first of two Red scares. There'll be another one in, in post World War II. Let's uh, watch our next film. This is a short film. So the guy in the film is a little opinionated. So understand I'm not trying to push these films on you that this is the way I want you to think. I want you to view these and come up with your own conclusion. Uh, so some some of these have, you know, are, are opinionated. They're, they're just, you know, people on, on YouTube in some cases. But I choose these films for a reason because there's some 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 content that I think is valuable. So in this case... Uh, please keep that in mind. Make your own judgments about what he's saying. But, but again, the, the information in general is good. So please watch the film, The 1919 Red Scare, the craziest year in American history. And then come on back. Okay, so, so this, this fear nationwide led to government overreaction. The government overreacted. And the government starts to, to conduct raids on what they call subversive. So what's a subversive? A subversive, subversive sorry, is a person that undermines the power and authority of an established system or institution. This is, this is the era that the, you have the rise of the FBI and a man named J, J. Edgar Hoover. So Hoover, before, before the FBI was started, he, he ran the anti-radicalism division of the Justice Department. And that kind of morphed into the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the FBI. Of course, the FBI is, is huge in this era. We'll talk more about them in, in the in the 30s with prohibition and all that. Um, even the Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, the Palmer Race, uh, they arrest 6,000 people uh, for potentially being a communist. So I'm just going to tell you again. Constitution doesn't say it's against the law to be a communist. You can be a communist, you can be a white supremacist, you can be a, you know, anything that you want. You want to be a Nazi, you can be any religion you want in this country. You can you can you can tell the world that you are a Nazi. And it's okay. It's it's legal. The the general public may not like it, but regardless of that. You can express yourself the way you want to in this country. That's what a free country is about. That's what people die for to keep it free. But in this era, not so. So again, it's legal to be a communist today. And it was, was back then too, but Hoover takes this to a whole new level and kind of pushes this and, and creates this hysteria. And people are getting arrested for just simply having a belief. So not exactly the American way, but again, this is why we study history. There, there's always moments where it doesn't seem to go the way it's supposed to. You know, it, it, does America always live up to its cornerstone values? No, not always. And I mentioned before, what's important about America is its cornerstone values, not the people that sometimes manipulate them to serve their own their, their own uh, needs or, or or wants. Okay. Uh, so J. Edgar Hoover comes to power in this era and uh, is a powerful man, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, and, and a voice, a very conservative uh, voice. Um, just, just for fun, um, let's watch the film uh, about, uh, it's, it's entitled J. Edgar Official Trailer. So this was a movie back in 2011 with, with Leonardo DiCaprio as, as J. Edgar Hoover. Just, just just for fun, it's very short. Just kind of give you an overview of what this man, you know, kind of looked like and his points of views. I always like to bring in, you know, popular history or media or film because I'm I have an interest in that. So go ahead and watch that. Go ahead and watch. It's kind of like the preview for the movie. Go ahead and watch that and come on back. Okay, so Hoover led the FBI for nearly 50 years, from the presidency of Calvin Coolidge through Richard Nixon. Uh, the FBI was very successful, fought organized crime. Uh, very integral in the efforts in World War II, fighting espionage and sabotage. Uh, but they were also accused of tampering with people's privacy. Uh, Hoover was to the far right politically, conservative, some say paranoid, uh, accused of being a racist. This is an interesting man. This, this is a man who was gay. But in that era, especially being the head of the FBI, this isn't something you could, you could be comfortable about coming out 
uh, you know, over. So he, he was a closeted gay. Okay. He, he didn't let anybody know. Uh, he never married, lived with his mother into its forties until her death. So, you know, uh, uh, we don't have that situation so much, although we still, we still have remnants of it in this country. There's still people that are homophobic and, but I mean, we're getting there. Uh, but in, in his day, uh, a man of his power could never come out and say I'm gay because nobody would have ever accepted him. Um, uh, okay. So, so again, the, the, the hunt for communists and like I said, it's free country and it was back then. It was legal then. It's legal now. As long as you don't break the law or destroy property, you can, you can demonstrate and, and, and express who you are and what your belief is. Uh, so most of these people being arrested by Palmer and by Hoover were, were innocents. They, not not to suggest that they didn't uh, arrest anybody that was a communist, but again, it's not against the law. So that's what that's what happened. The country overreacts to the to the feelings of the time, and and they and they go on these hunts. Okay, uh, and and many people look back on it and say it was a witch hunt. So so what do I mean by a witch hunt? Uh, this is an interesting kind of idea. Of course the where this where this name came from is Salem witch trials in the 1692 Salem Massachusetts and hysteria broke out in that city because some young girls were claiming that others and themselves were witches and then suddenly everyone was a witch and innocent people were accused and could not defend themselves the public were convinced mob mentality takes over and many people were executed they, they clearly were not witches so the definition of a witch hunt, the act of unfairly looking for and punishing people who are accused of having opinions that are believed to be dangerous or evil, and the searching out and deliberate harassment of those such as political opponents with unpopular views. So in those days, it truly was about trying to find witches, at least that's what they believed. Today, when we, heard, when we hear the term witch hunt, we hear it a lot. It has nothing to do with witches anymore. It has to do with politics, typically. It's the idea where a person or a party whip up a fervor about their opponents and point fingers at them and try to get the general public to believe that they're doing something wrong. So it's much like yellow journalism, sensationalizing the facts <clears throat> in an attempt to get public opinion to turn against them. Of course, Donald Trump's been, been you know, uh, claiming since he became the president in 2016 that, that the that the uh, you know the left or the Democratic Party is on a witch hunt to discredit him, um, uh, and his you know his detractors are accused of setting him up, lying about the issues that turn public opinion against the president. Uh, so let's watch our next film. This is a, this is I mean this is only a few years ago, but a little dated as far as Trump goes because he's in a whole different place today in many ways with the impeachment behind him and the coronavirus and the violence in the streets. It's a whole different set of circumstances today, but not that long ago, this, this was from 2017, Trump was pushing this idea that there's a, it's a witch hunt that's after me. So please watch the film. Is it a witch hunt on President Trump or is it not? Uh, so go ahead and watch that and come on back. Okay, so what do you think? It, was Trump a victim of a witch hunt? Is he still? by subversive liberals trying to undo him and discredit him. So another famous witch hunt in history, so I'm just going to talk about this briefly because this has to do with the second Red Scare that we'll talk about after World War II in this class, but just to kind of keep in this theme of a witch hunt, probably the most famous one was Joseph McCarthy in the 1950s, accusing, this is a senator, accusing nearly everyone in government, the military, and the entertainment business of being a communist and people rushed to judgment and people lost their jobs and careers. Okay. Uh, an interesting example, maybe more modern happened in Los Angeles uh, in the 1980s and early nineties, the McMartin preschool. The Costley's trial in U S history was the McMartin preschool trial, a case of satanic abuse, hysteria, keyword. The investigator's bias resulted in children recalling stories of witches flying, traveling in hot air balloons, being flushed down the toilet, and having been assaulted by Chuck Norris. 
Um, okay, so this is all happening in a preschool. Okay, so understand the context here. Uh, so this was an interesting story, and I happened to be living in LA when this happened. And this happened in Manhattan Beach, and I live pretty close. I lived in Hermosa Beach, one one city south. So I would drive by the McMartin Preschool every day on my way to work. It, it was, uh, you know, it was a uh, had been around for for many years. The the uh, the grandmother started, and her daughter kept the business going. Then her son, who was probably about the same age as me. Uh, of course, this is 30 years ago. Uh, he was running at that time. Okay, uh, and then suddenly, out of the blue, all these young children that were students there or preschoolers there, parents are screaming about all this, all these crazy things happening at this preschool, and uh, people rushed to judgment and went on a on a witch hunt. So this is this is Manhattan Beach, California, a a wealthy you would think pro more progressive city than, 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 than many. Okay. And I'm not trying to be offensive to Alabama, but not Birmingham, Alabama, where, where, where we know there was much racial strife at well, actually we'll, we'll learn that later in this class, but this is, this is, this is left coast, Los Angeles beach city. Okay. But the people there were up in arms. And one of my best friends who, who still is one of my best friends, he, he wanted to go down there and, and, you know, burn the place down. We we all had young kids in those days, and uh, you know, um, uh, you you're concerned, okay? So, what what actually happened? And my friend was not part of it, by the way. But but they finally did. The, the community went and burnt the place down to the ground, raised it. It was gone. These people were in hiding, and they had to leave the city uh, fixtures for for gener a couple to few generations. And Finally came to trial and all of it was disproved. None of it was true. None of it happened. There was no witches. There was supposed to be a dungeon that the kids were forced into and all these awful things and, and some, some kind of physical abuse going on. And none of it was proven to be true. It was just the imagination run amok by, by young kids that, that were being kind of um, pushed by their parents to, to say these things. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's a witch hunt. They went in a witch hunt, and the, and the community in 1990 burnt the, burnt the place down. So this is no different. The, the community reaction is no different in 1990 than, than it was in, in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692 or, or whatever it was. Same, same exact thing happened all, 300 years later. Uh, it's still, a, you know, history re repeats itself. So anyway, that's kind of the... You know, it, a, a, a few examples of a witch hunt and the relevance of a witch hunt, and you'll you'll continue to hear this throughout the rest of your lives. Witch hunts a big, a big thing in in, in politics today. So back to our our era. So the fear of communists was very real. People were concerned. The Bolshevik Revolution happened mid in the midst of World War One. Working people rose to overthrow the oppressive government that helped them, that held, in their minds held them down. The United States government was fearful that this influence would inspire a revolt in the United States. They, they didn't want a Bolshevik revolution in their country. So we talked about this idea that the progressive era, you know, uh, saved America from another revolution. That That's where this idea comes from. Um, but it's interesting how we look back and it's hard for, for me anyway to look back on this era. I mean, wouldn't, it, wouldn't a way to prevent a lot of this would be this, just to simply enforce your own laws the Reconstruction Amendments, you know, give people the opportunity stated in the Constitution and enforce it. You're going to have a free country. You can you can be a communist. You can be whatever you want to be. There shouldn't be any problem. But uh, but they don't do that. And the government uh, overreacts. And because they overreact, the uh, you know enforcement agencies overreact, and we get this all the time. We're, we're living in an era right now where the law enforcement agencies are overreacting and and you know doing uh, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. So this this kind of thing goes on goes on a lot. Um, in a free country, we should allow everyone to be who they want to be, uh, as long as they don't break the law. Give everyone access to opportunities. Uh, but you know, it's human history here. It's not just American history. It's human history of all eras and countries and whatever it might be. When you're talking about humans, and I hate to say it, but it's true, including Americans. It's also based on a deep-seated greed and selfishness that's very much a part of who we are. We have to, 
you know, Freud says, we, especially men have to learn to become civilized. It's the truth for all of us. Okay, this, this era of, of, of the post-war is also the era where women uh, come together and finally get the vote, okay? So, so uh, women enter politics and they finally get a voice. Uh, the, the Women's Joint Congressional Committee passed the Shepherd Towner Act of, uh, of 1920 uh, What did that do? Funded medical clinics, prenatal education programs, and visiting nurses. So again, going to the, what did men do? What did women do? It seemed that men started wars and drank too much in this era. And then I'm, I'm not being judgmental, guys. It's just, it's the truth. You, you see lots of evidence of it. Women always seem to come in and clean it all up, start reforms and try to come up with ways to get their husbands to clean up their acts. So perhaps Freud was right when he said that men are bestial, okay? Um, so this is the era of, of, of the roaring 20s and, and women are, let, are set loose and people let go of the old Victorian morals and values. So why, why, why be stuffy? Why, why be moralistic? Live life while you can, enjoy yourself, Blood can be short, as World War I proved. Uh, so, you know, during this war, the world had experienced the underside of humanity, the cruelty that people had inside them. But who cares about the future? So the, you have an overextension of credit, a consumer-driven decade. Women were, were in the, in the uh, limelight and out in the public. For the, you know, the, that wasn't the way it was in the Victorian days. And you've got women smoking and drinking and flapping. You see the picture at the bottom on the on the right: women in shorter skirts, bare legs, doing they're called flappers, doing a dance. Uh, so this is a this is the opposite of, of Victorian. It's a, it's a total reaction to the 1920s, much like the 1960s, but in a little bit different way. But the 1960s are a complete reaction to, of the 1950s, where where people are felt stifled and they wanted to break loose, okay? So the, so the Roaring Twenties is this kind of wild and, and crazy decade. Um, so let's watch our next film. It's called Get Ready for the Roaring Twenties. Uh, so it looks at the changes in women's lives. Uh, much more expression, freedoms. They broke out of their, dreary, dreary, uh, excuse me, broke out of their dreary lives, serving and catering to their husbands. But understand that this lifestyle portrayed in this film mostly this is not available to people of color. This is this is for the white middle upper class. Um, white working class whites weren't living like this either. And this is the way that the, the, the country chose to portray itself. Hollywood at that time, most of those movies are about wealthy white people in limousines and, and living this carefree life in, in this era. Uh, not, not exactly the way everybody was living. So under, understand that. Um, but the decade did affect everyone, and it definitely set a standard that everyone aspired to. So go ahead and watch that film, and then come on back. Okay, part of the history of the Roaring Twenties is also prohibition. Uh, 1919, Congress passed the Volstead Act, a way to eliminate drunkenness, get rid of saloons, prevent absenteeism, provide a system for enforcing the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment... Uh, prohibited the manufacture, sale, and transport of alcohol in the United States. So women's groups finally got this pushed through. They've been pushing for it for a long time. Sobriety, uh, you know, uh, male drunkenness leads to violence at home. Let's get rid of this. And they and they get it pushed through. Unfortunately, this if, if it, in America, probably even today, if, if the government said you can't, it's against a lot of drink, probably people would continue. Same thing happened to them. Where are you going to get your alcohol from? Well, it's going to come from a, from a place that's perhaps not so great. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So go ahead and watch the film, uh, History of Prohibition, Why It Failed, and then come on back. Okay, so you, you have the rise of the mafia. And uh, you know, because you got to, there's an opportunity here. Alcohol, alcohol is illegal, but everybody wants it. So let's bootleg. <clears throat> So the mafia grows in, in strength and power, made huge money supplying the public with illegal alcohol. And you have illegal taverns. You have what are called speakeasies, where you can come and say whatever you'd like. Uh, you, you know, you, you went to a speakeasy or a bar. There wouldn't be a big sign out in front that said bar. It would look like a bookstore. 
in a quiet man working behind the counter, but you walk in through right past where you can get to the back door and it opens up into a, you know, a den of, of gambling and, and women and alcohol. Okay, that was kind of what a speakeasy is about. And of course, you pay off the police to look the other way. A typical patrolman on the street probably got paid off more to look the other way than his entire salary for the year. So, uh, so you have the rise of the mafia, Al Capone, Scarface, uh, the, perhaps the most famous gangster of this era, uh, and the rise of organized crime in the 1920s. And of course, the FBI, you know, fights with them, and that's a pretty famous uh, conflict of that era. <clears throat> So finally, the 18th Amendment was repealed by the 21st Amendment in 1933, jumping ahead a little bit. But uh, interesting, that for this decade of kind of wild, uh, you know, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, who cares about tomorrow, let's party, 1920, 1933, you have 13 years where alcohol is illegal, but yet everybody's drinking. Okay, so an interesting kind of idea. Okay, also in the 20s, the ACLU was formed, very important organization even today, uh, uh, founded to protect constitutional freedoms for everybody, such as speech, religion. So, so the times, they were a changing, and, and we talked about the Scopes trial, teaching evolution in public schools, an indication of the changing times, moving away from the Victorian stuffy, moralistic kind of, uh, you know, idea to a more secular not be holding to a religion community again that's not against religion it's just that it's not it's not every it's not every, a part of your every uh, every minute of, of everyday life okay uh, alice paul is an important uh women's rights leader of that era uh uh considered a radical push for the era equal rights amendment was in prison many times when in hunger strikes you know a, a woman that was absolutely committed to her cause and the ERA was born. It didn't pass then. It 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 was um, this idea of that men and women shall have equal rights throughout the United States. There's there's nowhere in the Constitution that says that. It doesn't say anywhere that men and women have equal rights. Uh, so it failed in in Alice Paul's time, but then it came to life again in the 1970s and 80s. Equality rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So the first chapter post World War, I'm sorry, post Civil War, uh, the Fifteenth Amendment gave males the right to vote, not women. They said, but put the word sex in there, be given to everybody, but they didn't. So here, here you are, a hundred years later, uh, even more than that, and women tried again. It still did not pass. Okay, so uh, still there still is not an equal, equal rights amendment. So what about what about politics? You have you have an era of the 20s where you have three Republican presidents in a row. Warren G. Harding, uh, known as a as a you know a partier and wild times in the White House, um, lots of women coming and going and drinking and carousing and debauchery. Um, you've got Calvin Coolidge, another Republican, the kind of the opposite of Harding, but same ideology of the, uh, the Republican Party. And then finally, Hoover, uh, where this whole thing will come undone under his watch. So uh, so I mentioned, we, we talked about this era of Republican domination from, from uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, I should say from James Buchanan, the last Democrat to be elected before the Civil War, all the way to Franklin Roosevelt, 71 something years. Uh, you only have two uh, men that are Democrats in that era. The rest were, were Republicans. But Hoover's administration is where that domination would end because the Great Depression comes out of here. And, and, then, you, and then you have a, uh, an era of, of the, where the Democrats dominate, okay? So going back to Harding, Harding died in office of a heart attack, but then evidence emerged of corruption in his administration. And this is called the, the Teapot Dome Scandal. So Teapot is a city in Wyoming, and it turns out that bribes were being accepted for leasing oil reserves in Teapot that, that Harding, you know, had his had his hand in. Well, of course, he's gone. He he had passed away by then. Uh, but uh, this this is a it, it's corruption too. Okay, so the Republican Party let go of most of the progressive reforms of the pre-war era. Antitrust put on the shelf. 
The United States Steel became a huge monopoly. And this is after the trust buster, Teddy Roosevelt, and all that happened before. I said, this is a whole different era now. People start thinking differently about their country and, and, and the direction they want to go, to go in after heroin events. So post-World War I, people were still in shock from all the death and negativity, okay? This is also the era where military deployments to further American causes became the norm and have continued throughout the entirety of the 20th century um, to further Americans' foreign policy agenda. Uh, and and it's, it's somewhat of the return of manifest destiny. We, we need to convert everybody to Christianity. We're going to treat non-white peoples like children that need our help and guidance. This becomes very much a part of American foreign policy in the 1920s. They returned to ethnocentrism, Americanization. I mean, it meant well in some cases, but truly it sought to remove or at least sanitize, dare I say it, whiten people's cultures, homogenize anybody that was not like Americans and make everyone the same, okay? So we don't we don't live in in the era that 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 pushes that I, I guess some people would argue that but we live in, in an era where we're trying to anyway uh, talk about diversity and inclusion and you know uh, celebrate people's differences not turn away because they're different than you are or or categorize them as different just accept them I do these things you do those things celebrate differences this is what this is what we're trying to get to today instead of just rejecting someone because they don't look like you or they don't believe in your religion or they don't speak your language or their skin color is different. So, so today we, we push for diversity, the inclusion of individuals representing more than one national origin, color, religion, socioeconomic stratum, or sexual orientation. Okay. Um, so our last film for part one of tw chapter 22, this is a short film on this idea called what is diversity so diversity what does that mean you know, it's one of those words that people use freely but i'm actually surprised in a face-to-face -face class i'll ask the question someone tell me what diversity is and for the most part people get it but perhaps not entirely a uh, few people can define what it really means so this is a short film that was done on, on an american college campus so relative to what we you know who we are asking college students what it means to them. So please watch the film, What is Diversity? Okay, but as we have learned, history has a way of consuming itself. You know, something else will happen that will stop that movement and start an opposite one. People get tired of the same thing. They want change. So, you know, all election campaigns say it's time for a change. Even when, when the country has it right, uh, return to the past. So let's go back in time. Make America Great Again is a great example of that. Many people have used the Make America Great, great Again, um, uh, you know, uh, idea. Quote: uh, It wasn't started with Donald Trump. It goes way back. It's been used many times. Anytime a a party is not in power, they they flood the public with "Let's return to better times" point of view. As a person who studies American history pretty intently, I can't imagine a time that's better than right now. I mentioned before, you don't have to make America great again. It's already great. But this is politics. You're trying to get votes. It's not, it's not about reality. It's about getting votes. So this is where it comes from. Uh, time for change. Keep calm. Let's go, let's go back to the past where, where, where everybody was happy. Uh, so... You know, this is this is also this this era, 1920s. You know, Americans begin to have a negative Im image internationally. And this goes back to the that American character coming out of the frontier and in um, manifest destiny, Western expansion. We talked about a few chapters back. Uh, Americans begin to be seen internationally as too aggressive and conceited, especially men that expect to have their way and implement policies that will benefit them. Okay. And yet this this idea called dollar diplomacy coming out of this era, the use of a country's financial power to extend its international influence. But you have you have a response to this. And of course, there, there, there always will be a response to anything that's that's, you know, uh, an idea in a free country. That's the beauty of it. 
The United States cannot go on destroying with impunity the sovereignty of other peoples, however weak. And this is what many people have responded. We can't keep on. It's not always about us. Even in the 1920s, they were they were complaining about this. Okay. So what is sovereignty? Sovereignty a state is sovereign when it enjoys full authority internally. They can they manage themselves internally, and is not subject to the authority of another state or country. Okay. Uh, that is the end of chapter 22, part one. Uh, please go to uh, part two. Thank you.